Hello everyone, welcome to STAT 479 lecture 22. Uh, and so this is the second lecture of the uh, corresponding to the project, which is really about you know how you kind of deal with real data and uh, and uh, scientific uh, problems. And um, and we're, we're at the moment uh, kind of in the middle of going through a demo. So we have those nine tasks. I went through kind of the first couple of tasks uh, associated with the uh, the demo data set that I provided. Um, and so today I'm gonna really be focusing on tasks three and four. Some particular task three involves like exploratory data analysis, which is the third task. And then uh, the fourth task is data pre-processing. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about one feature of this particular data set, which is that we have categorical features as I spoke about. So the features are, are represented as categories and not numerical values. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, you know, how we deal with that. Some of you may have seen this before, but a lot of you may, may not have as well. Um, and so uh, what I'll be doing is going to like, you know, a lot of the things, cause we're dealing with the real data, I'll be kind of going through it uh, with a combination of um, just explaining uh, on, on paper uh, or on, on, on the iPad, like I'm doing right now. And then I'm also gonna have some R code uh, associated with. So if you've, um, if you look at the, the course website, there's this file R code lect 22. Um, and I would recommend having that in front of you while I go through, uh, while going through this lecture, just so that you can kind of, I'll be occasionally referring to outputs from R files because that's gonna be useful. Um, so there'll be some R code in there and there'll also be some outputs. So I'll be talking through some of the, some useful things associated with R, at least that I know. You guys might actually know more if you've, uh, if you've used R a fair bit, but um, I, I'll, I'll kind of go through kind of the, the basic steps. So tasks one and two focused on, uh, you know, uh, introducing the, the sort of the scientific, like, you know, getting the data set and then like understanding kind of the, the scientific um, question or, or goal. And, uh, and then trying to understand where the data is actually coming from. coming from. Um, and so now we're gonna move on to the third uh, task, which is exploratory data analysis, which is, you know, as I mentioned, each of these tasks is, you know, very important kind of in, in their own right. And it has nothing to do with anything we've learned in the course. It's more about kind of data intuition and, uh, but, but, you know, one of the more kind of important steps in, uh, in doing data analysis. So. Um, what does exploratory data analysis means? It, it just kind of means that you're exploring the data in kind of a, you know, very sort of simple way. You're not planning, you're not trying to run any complicated algorithms at this point. All you're trying to do is just get a feel for what the data actually looks like. And that might point you to that. This is a really important step because it kind of determines what decisions you might make in terms of pre-processing or which algorithms to use and how you might need to tweak certain algorithms or certain pre-processing to adapt to the particular data that, that you're looking at. So when you're doing, so this is where you're gonna start to be using like R or whatever other programming language to kind of look at your data because you typically want to sort of look a little bit beyond uh, just uh, the, you know, j j like just beyond just looking at, uh, you know, the text file that, uh, that has that, that data set. So some natural questions to think about is, you know, you know, here we have, so, so, so just to, you know, what, what do we know about the data so far? So the data we have is, um, we have N equals 988 samples. Just by looking at the text file, what do we know? So we know that Y is in uh, zero one. Um, and then we have um, X1, X2 up to X8. Um, and then here where XJ is uh, categorical features. Categorical features where, uh, you know, XJ is in one, two, three. And again, these one, two, and three do not represent numerical values. They just represent, uh, you know, which parent that is. So it's a categorical variable or categorical feature. Um, so that's what we know about the data just by kind of looking at it and, and in, the, in the text file and just understanding it. Um, and, and just, you know, sort of thinking about where the, where the data actually, uh, actually came from. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, questions that we might just ask straight off the bat that don't really, you know, question, like go into the algorithm. So like, you know, questions like, you know, is, you know, is uh, data well balanced? And what do we mean by that? Like, um, 
you know, like, does, does that, you know, does, does that, does that, you know, would like, uh, is, is the number of uh, positives and negative uh, responses, uh, are they roughly the same? Um, that, that, that's a natural question. So we roughly see like every category a uniform number of times. So that's kind of what I mean by is data well balanced. And, you know, those kinds of questions are ones that we can kind of address uh, straight away. Um, and, 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 you know, that's what we're going to do with the exploratory data analysis here. Um, so, um, the first thing you need to do is to, you know, and this is often, you know, not a completely trivial step is to read data, uh, into R and I'm going to say R, but you can use, if you, if you feel comfortable with a different language, you can totally use that. Uh, one thing I should also say right here is that, um, in the actual report, I don't really want to see any R code, um, in the actual report, it's okay to include that in the appendix. So certainly include any relevant R code in the appendix. So I should sort of put a note here that uh, um, all R code uh, should be deferred uh, to our appendix. So all, all the R code, like I don't wanna see any R code in the main report. That should all be deferred to the to the appendix, because uh, you know our code is you know just it's it's code that you're using to implement what you want to do. I'd rather you just describe in words what you're what you're doing rather than uh, just like throw a bunch of R code uh, at me. Um, so so that's um so so that's that that's you know important. I'm I'm including the R code here just to give you an idea of how to potentially get started in R. So reading data into R. Um, so a good place to start is read.table, which, uh, which is the command I'm using here. Um, sometimes you might have to do slightly more complicated things. I should also point out that, you know, uh, not every single command that you need will be in this file because I'm specifically dealing with my data and your data will potentially be in different formats. So using both Google to sort of help you navigate uh, like what, what code to use is gonna be important. Uh, and also the help uh, the, the help command in R. So if you don't know about read.table, if you do help uh, bracket parentheses read.table, that tells you a bit, but you know, I can't promise, I like, I, there certainly won't be, like you'll, I, I, I'm guaranteeing you that you'll need to kind of help or use Google at times to find commands because not everything is gonna kind of be handed to you. And that's gonna be the same thing in a job. Like if you if you get a, a job in, uh, in statistics, um, or, or something related, you are gonna need to kind of find commands on the run as you go. So this is kind of an important exercise in that too. So um, I'll just say that, um, you know, read.table um, is a good starting point. Um, is a good starting point. Um, so uh, I'm, um, you know, I, th this works quite nicely because it's in the form of a text file. So um, I input that in. Um, the other thing I should mention is, is that you should be careful about copying and pasting directly from this file into R because R does some weird, because there's some weird conversions that go on when you have things like, uh, you know, like uh, like commas and, uh, you know, um, you know, like, like, like various different symbols get translated incorrectly. So you should be like, I, I mean, I, I'm putting the code here to give you a guide, but I, I, I mean, if you try and copy and paste, if you try and cut and paste the code, you could also run into problems. So make sure that you, um, you know, type in the code as you go, just, just to make sure that, uh, you're doing it uh, correctly. Um, okay. And so, uh, so, so we're reading in the table works reasonably well, and that kind of gives you a table. And then the next thing I want to do is to split into X and Y. So, uh, I use the, you know, I, I, I kind of generate X and Y as the next couple of things that you'll see on the, on the R code. Um, and then I also have this command, which tells me what the length of Y is. That's really just a sanity check to make sure that everything looks good. So as you type in the commands, you should always just look to make sure that, the data looks like what you expect it to look like. Um, and you can see the syntax here that, um, you know, the the uh, the square brackets kind of allows you to access specific elements of your uh, of your particular data frame. Okay, so, so that's just kind of reading in the data. Um, and it, as I mentioned, this is 
not always a trivial step. Um, and, and so, you know, just make sure you do that, uh, do that correctly. Um, and so one thing to note here, and this is one of the things that potentially will come up in the data that you have is that, uh, the X, uh, um, the X here is, uh, So for this data set, um, X is uh, stored as a as a as an eight digit integer. Um, one thing you can do to check the type of something is there's this function uh, type of in R. Um, so is so if you're not sure, because like what data type you're actually dealing with is really important because if it's if it's the wrong data type, it's gonna you know treat things very differently to what you what you want so using the function type of is uh, is very useful for uh so i'll just say I'll, I'll write that down so so type of is another useful function here um because that tells you that tells you what uh what type the uh type the data is and x is actually stored as an integer here which is not what it is i mean it's it's essentially eight categorical variables together so um, we somehow need to deal with that. One other thing I forgot to mention is that um, the one one of the things that like trips people up a lot is to know what working directory you have. So if you kind of if if you download a file to a particular spot on your computer, you need to make sure that your working directory matches uh, where you are. And so there's this R thing, which like in in the miscellaneous uh, option in in R. It allows you to change the working directory, so make sure you get the working directory right. Otherwise, nothing's going to work when you're downloading files from your computer to uh, to R. So, um, so 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 this is again kind of a you know a, a one of these sort of annoying computational things that we have to deal with. That you know we have an integer and uh, we want and but but we really want to convert it into. Uh, in, into an in, into a into a, into a um, vector or or a matrix. So the next thing I do is to you know convert eight uh, digit integer into um, into uh, uh, into length eight into length eight vector. Um, so that so that you split up each of the categorical variables, and here we use the command string split str split. Um, again, this was not something I sort of you know knew straight off the top of my head. I googled it and found it very quickly. It's pretty easy to find once you uh, once you Google. Um, and so that's what the next kind of thing is. Do that's what the next like converting each um, each string in X. Sorry, that should be string, not strong in X to uh, to a to to a vector or a matrix. And so. That's kind of the next thing I'm doing. Like getting things into the right format is is sort of the starting point before you do any analysis, whether it is an exploratory data analysis or you're doing something a little bit uh, more uh, more more concrete. Um, and then uh, now now we're now we're kind of in a position to uh, to to kind of look at the data a little bit more. Um, so we're looking at the question of you know what is kind of the distribution of the uh, of the uh, of the different uh, categorical variables across the eight positions. So the next thing I'm doing is I'm creating a three by eight or, or an eight by three matrix, where eight is kind of the position index, and one, two, three represents which table, which, which parent you have. And so, um, so we know that uh, so n is equal to nine eighty eight, um, nine eighty eight, and then we have an eight by three table. Uh, which tells you um, like how frequently how frequently does uh, each parent occur occur in uh, each position. Okay, and so that's what this this next table is representing. So, the rows here should add up to nine hundred eighty eight. So hopefully you're looking at that, and that that certainly is the case. So just check that that's the case that the rows should all add up to nine eighty eight. And if things were uniformly randomly distributed, you expect things to look roughly even. 
And by and large, they're okay. There's one really big kind of outlier here that um, if you look at uh, the, uh, you know, um, if you look at position four, uh, amino, like a uh, uh, parent, parent two, that only occurs eight times. So this is kind of very weird that you, you know, in a data set of 988, so, um, you know, with 988 samples that, you know, only, only eight times that we, we see parent two coming. So we expect sort of roughly about 300, 300, 300 to 400, or, you know, 250 to 350 or something for each across, uh, for each position. And, you know, we're reasonably okay in, in that sense in it for, for most of the uh, positions, but position four has this weird thing that parent two appears only eight times. And so that's something to sort of keep in mind. And uh, I mean, something that I, uh, I did ask my collaborator about, and, and it is, it is sort of an artifact of the scientific experiment that means that uh, parent two doesn't usually, uh, you know, bind well to the other two in that position. So that's sort of a, a property of, of the chemistry that, uh, that that leads to that. But that's something that I didn't know and I just sort of found by doing the simple uh, exploratory data analysis. Um, so that's kind of one thing to look at the, the you know, in terms of just the a sanity check for the frequencies. Another thing which I haven't put in, um, which you can check yourself, is that, uh, you know, is uh, are the Ys balanced? Um, like, are the, are the Ys balanced? And so in... Um, So, uh, so what you can sort of see is that uh, there's going to be 60, 657 ones and uh, 331 zeros uh, in, in your Ys. Um, and so that's okay. Like it's not perfectly balanced. You have about two thirds of your data is functional and about one third is non-functional. And that's sort of, it's, it's imbalanced, but it's not so badly imbalanced that we would really worry too much about it. So um, sometimes if your data is really imbalanced, like there's, you know, 95% ones and 5% zeros or the other way around, you might need to do some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of weighting of the, of like reweighting to give more weight to the, to the samples that, that appear less frequently. But here we have reasonably good balance. And, and then in the X's as well, like with these different categories, you'd say that the balance is somewhat reasonable to uh, to look at. So that's just sort of a simple sanity check just to make sure that, you know, the data we're looking at isn't sort of totally weird and, and symmetric. Like the one thing we found that was pretty weird was that uh, that there's only like, that, there, that um, parent two never seems to occur in the uh, in the fourth position or almost never does. And uh, and again, that comes back to the uh, to the chemistry. The next thing I'm going to do is a very simple sort of analysis. So, um, you know, the question I'm looking at is how does distribution of ones uh, compared to compared to distribution of zeros? Okay, and so. Um, Again, uh, like what we need to do here is kind of is extract the indices that are ones and extract the indices that are zeros. So here, like um, you can look at the code here, but the command which, uh, w h i c h, uh, is useful here to um, to find uh, indices that correspond to like when y is one and when y is zero. Um, and the reason why this is going to be a useful uh, exploratory thing to do is because we can kind of look, like without doing anything fancy, we can look to kind of see if, you know, we can see a difference in the in the distribution of the, uh, in the distribution of the sequences for the ones and the zeros. You'd expect that there is a difference, but we kind of want to see if that is the case or not, just by doing, looking at these this simple frequency table. Okay, and so, I've done like, you know, it's about what, five, seven lines of code to do that. And we can see the frequency tables uh, for, for zero and one there. And um, 
they're reasonably insightful, but what's hard to compare is is that what like like zeros have three thirty one samples, whereas ones have six fifty seven. So ideally, you want to kind of normalize by this, so divide by that, and so uh, that's why I've kind of normalized there uh, there later. And so then the thing that I want you to look at is right at the bottom of that page. There's freak table zero and freak table one, which looks at the proportion of uh, of uh, like each each parent in each position. So one thing to make sure is to you know is uh sum of uh each row each row one. Um, so if it's not, then something that you, then you've done something wrong. But in this case, you can hopefully see that that is the case that the sum of each row is uh is one. Um, and so you can see, look at the dis different distributions and compare them and. Uh, and so uh, you can see that things do, do look a little bit different between one and zero. And the best thing to probably look at is like, so, um, so difference uh, between freak table zero and freak table one. So that's the very last thing you'll see in the, uh, in the R code. Um, all right, I've done freak table one minus freak table zero. So here the sum of the rows should be, the sum of the rows here should be zero. Because you know, you're you're subtracting two things that, that both add up to one. Um, and that is indeed the case here. And so what this is, is the difference. So if there was no difference between the two, you would just get a zero in every entry and you would say that, you know, both the functional and the non-functional sequences have pretty like similar uh, similar sequence structure, which is not what you'd kind of expect. You'd sort of hope that you know some that there's some signal to tell you that uh, that the functional and the non-functional sequences or the ones and the zeros have a different sort of a distribution, and that is indeed the case. So, like if we we can kind of see that um, you know if you look at like some of the really large values both in the the positive and the negative direction. So like um, you can see that uh, in position one, um, uh, like, uh, so in position one, parent two uh, suggests uh, more functional and parent uh, three suggests less functional. And that's simply because, you know, we have a very large positive value uh, for, you know, one, two, and then a very large negative value for uh, for one, three. So that kind of tells you that already. Um, and you can kind of also see that, uh, you know, uh, another, uh, another significant one is, uh, you know, in position five, in position five, let me. So in position five, we have that uh, parent uh, parent one. Uh, parent one uh, suggests uh, less functional because it's a very large negative value. So um, if you if you see if you see the first parent in the fifth position. That's likely to tell you that it's uh, it's less functional, um, and yeah. So those are sort of two of the uh, two of the really sort of significant ones that uh, you can kind of just look at and and see. And then I guess one more uh, just to to put that in is like you know in in position seven, um, uh, like it said it suggests that uh, you know parent three suggests it's. Uh, or I'll just say parent three uh, okay parent three seems to uh, increase functionality so So, I mean, this is what I'm getting just by doing a very simple uh, exploratory data analysis, nothing complex or anything like that. Um, and so this is just, you know, just to give you a flavor of what you might do 
far off for exploratory data analysis. You can keep doing more and more. Um, one thing, uh, you know, so one thing to note is that uh, this EDA uh, only considers uh, frequency, frequencies uh, in each position. Um, and so it's, it's a, it, that's why it's, you know, it's a very simple kind of, uh, a very simple kind of analysis, but you might, you know, like for things like, you know, interactions and uh, conditional dependences and so on, uh, we can't quite see that with the exploratory data analysis. And hopefully the idea is, is that, you know, if we, if we do some more sophisticated, use some more sophisticated techniques, which I'll, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later, um, you will hopefully see a little bit, um, you know, you'll, you'll hopefully see something a little bit uh, a more, uh, okay, like, 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 so, so some more kind of complex and involved relationships than what we see with frequency. But this is just kind of a rough idea to, to give, to give you a sense for what you are, what you might expect. So that's sort of all the exploratory data analysis that I'll kind of show for this data set. And so I just wanted to say that like, you know, again, everything I say is very specific to this, uh, to this data application. And so, um, you know, here I've just kind of, I plotted everything with numbers because we're dealing with very discrete data. So I just wanted to say that uh, for continuous data, for continuous data, um, you know, histograms, histograms um, or uh, correlation plots, very useful. Um, I should say, so, so like, I should also say like scatter plots. If you want to plot like, you know, X versus Y or something like that, uh, then, you know, these are very useful. Like, because we have bi the binary response, the scatter plot doesn't make that much sense. But, uh, you know, for continuous data, um, you know, histograms, correlation plots, uh, and scatter plots are very, very useful tools. And because my because the, this data set's discrete, I'm not doing that. But essentially, um, like histograms and correlation plots and scatter plots are like, in some sense, like doing very similar, like doing very similar things to what I'm showing here. Um, but because you have continuous data, you can't just kind of split the data up into ones and zeros, um, like I'm doing here. Because if your response is continuous, like doing a histogram of the, you know, you can't sort of bin all of your data like that. So, um, so that's why, uh, you know, tools like correlate, like scatter plots, uh, and so on would be useful. So, you know, for example, like for, for example, if, uh, if Y is continuous, um, then I'd sort of do like, um, you could do a scatter plot for, uh, each, each x j uh, to y, um, uh, and you could you could also do like uh, histograms for uh, x one, x two up to x p, and then also a histogram for y because that might tell you if you want to transform the data in uh, in some particular way. So, um, so that's just kind of a a hint on what you might expect to do if things are things are continuous. As I said, like each data set's very different and you know, has different types. And so the tools you use might be, might be quite different. So, um, so everything I say pertains to this data set, but the idea should hopefully carry across to, uh, to other data sets that you might be looking at. And yeah, as I said, exploratory data analysis, I mean, I've, I'm kind of just doing a very basic one just to show you how to get started. You can kind of spend as little or as much time as you want on this. Cause there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to look at the data. Okay, so that's kind of everything for, for exploratory data analysis. So the next question is really, so um, the next task is data pre-processing, and this kind of follows from my exploratory data analysis. Um, and so the data is reasonably very well balanced, so we don't really need to do a lot of, um, so, so no great, um, so, No significant normalization 
or weighting of the uh, of the data is required. Um, so you know, like, uh, like you know, you might, but but this is certainly not something that may be true for other data sets. So, like for example, if you're dealing with text data, you often have like very very large sparse sort of matrices, and you definitely need to do some kind of uh, reweighting for those to like if you want your uh, your results to kind of make sense. And so, uh, how you do the preprocessing is very important, and um, like. And, and if you don't do it correctly, you're often, or, or not, not correctly, but if you don't do it in a sensible way, then uh, you're often gonna get some kind of weird uh, weird results. So there's no, no significant normalization or weighting of the data required, but the greatest challenge that we have here is, so the greatest challenge here is that, here is that um, the uh, features, features or covariates, are categorical. So this is this is a significant challenge because you know we need to sort of th this leads to the question and this is a question you guys should also think about too with your project is how do we encode features? Um, you know, sometimes they'll be in kind of a nice form already that you don't need to encode them. But here we have very categorical, here we have categorical features. So certainly encoding is a very important step here. So let's, so let's, let's talk about encoding categorical features and features or covariates. So um, here we have, uh, you know, XJs in one, two, three. Um, and so, so there, there's a number of different ways we could encode this, but the most standard way is what's called, uh, the most standard encoding is what's called uh, one-hot encoding. Okay, and so all that is is that, um, expand, um, like, so we, so each, uh, xj is represented as a binary vector. So each xj is represented as a binary vector. Uh, um, we'll call that, uh, I'll just use this notation maybe, uh, X tilde J, um, which is going to be equal to uh, uh, um, X tilde J, uh, we'll say X tilde J K is going to be equal to um, one if uh, xj is equal to k and zero if uh, xj is not equal to k. So um, k, um, k equals one, two up to number of categories. So notice here that we've kind of, note uh, the total number of features, features in uh, encoding is is uh, um, is we'll say uh, like a p times uh, m where m is the number of categories 
So that's uh, kind of something to, to keep in mind that we have in some sense, like if you have a lot of categories, this can really expand the feature space a lot. Um, but it's, it's something that's kind of necessary to do. Um, let's make sure. So for example, um, let's just say that uh, X was equal to like, um, X is equal to, um, you know, one, three, two, two, one, one, uh, one, three. So then like, then your X tilde here is gonna be a uh, much longer uh, vector. I guess I'll put this in, uh, I think it's maybe easier to put this notation kind of in brackets, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit weird to do this, but I'll, I'll just kind of, cause, cause I kind of want to extend it out, but it's just going to be one zero zero and then it's going to be zero zero one. So this is like X tilde um, one. Um, this is X tilde two. And then you have zero one zero, zero one zero, one zero zero, one zero zero and then one zero zero and then zero zero one. So you can see you get a, a length, uh, a length 24 um, vector. X tilde eight. So this is kind of what uh, the X tilde might uh, look like when you start with an X. Uh, one thing to note here is, is that um, well, one thing to note is that the last feature is redundant. Is redundant. Um, is redundant since um, if uh, you know x. Uh, If xj equals one, uh, so so if I should say that um, uh, since um, you know since only one of the categories categories is uh, turned on. So, you know, we can certainly like reduce that uh, to like say that, you know, so reduce to uh, P times uh, M minus one dimensional vector. Okay, so uh, here, you know, your one's gonna get mapped to one zero, your two is gonna get mapped to zero one, and you, then your three is gonna get mapped to zero zero because Clearly, if the uh, first two categories are zero, then the third category must be one. And so you can reduce the, uh, then you can you can map X tilde to, uh, it's gonna be one zero. So let me just do this now. So one zero, um, zero zero, and then zero one, zero one, and uh, one zero, one zero, and then uh, one zero and then zero zero. So this is gonna be like uh, X tilde one, X tilde two, X tilde three, X tilde four, X tilde five, sorry, X tilde six, X tilde seven, and then X tilde eight. So this is kind of how we can represent it uh, in a way that uh, kind of like you know, like like what we're saying here is that if it's not uh, one or two, then it's clearly going to be three, and that's a perfectly reasonable way to sort of represent our uh, our feature, so that we don't have this uh, this additional redundancy. Um, and so, so um, R uh, sometimes does this uh, automatically. Sometimes it does this automatically if uh, 
if it can detect if it can if it can detect categorical features um and you usually detect categorical features because they'll be kind of strings, but um, you should check this carefully. And in this case, um, in this case, uh, uh, cannot detect. Uh, it cannot detect categorical features, and so. Um, this is something where, you know, we, and the reason, so, so why kind of detect categorical features? Because you've listed them as one, two, and three, right? So if it's one, two, and three, I mean, those could be numerical integers that represent a specific value. They could be ordinal variables where, you know, you're, all you're saying is that, you know, one's smaller than two, which is smaller than three, or they could be categories as they are in this case. So you need to actually specify to R that these are in fact uh, factors. And so this is where the command, um, our command factor allows you to, allows you to um, express uh, uh, features in uh, factor form. And I mean, it won't, it won't be represented as a binary vector, but R kind of knows then that it's a binary vector and it'll treat it as that. Like it'll, you'll see that it has this kind of command levels. And I will like briefly talk about uh, this in the, in I will briefly go into this in, in from the perspective of R in the next lecture, but uh, you'll, you'll have kind of, the, it'll, you'll be able to determine that R knows that it's, it's levels. And because this is such a common occurrence, many R functions actually have this, uh, have this built into them, that this mechanism, this capability of dealing with uh, categorical features into them. Okay, so um, you don't like, in usually in R, um, with the one hot encoding, you don't have to explicitly do that yourself. You're so, certainly more than welcome to, but a lot of R functions will kind of know, will like, if you use the factor command, or even if you input it, might even have a flag that says, are the variables factors uh, or not? So that's kind of how we, we do the feature encoding. And once we do the feature encoding, um, with feature encoding uh, done, um, the main preprocessing is done. But I will say sort of one more um, thing here. Uh, in terms of like before we kind of decide uh, which uh, which algorithms are uh, are best to use here, um, so um, one question to always consider um, Like how complex, um, and this is something that requires a fair bit of thought. Um, how complex a model should we use? Should we use for our features? Okay, and so, um, so like so 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 this is something that, that we can think about and it's a bit easier to actually think about in the discrete case in the continuous case a very analogous thing kind of applies but let's um so so here we have that uh, you know uh we have x1 uh x2 up to x8 um that each of these is in one two and three so um so there are up to uh, three to the eight uh, different uh, different input sequences. We obviously don't observe them. We we only observe nine eighty eight of them. 
So, um, so here we have that uh, n equals uh, 300, uh, 988. And then we have that um, we have up to three to the eight sequences. Um, so we certainly don't observe all of them. If you did observe all of them, there actually wouldn't really need even need be any need to do any statistical inference because uh, uh, the uh, um, because you would just know the map completely. But here we, uh, you know, we don't like part of the reason we do statistical inference is we want to kind of find rules. So um, so this is where notions of first order, second order interactions, and so on come in. So you may have kind of heard of. Uh, these kinds of concepts are uh, before, but uh, so uh, so this goes back to what assumptions do we make about behavior? Okay. Um, and this is actually going to be also very tied to what your sample size is. So, um, so, so, so one general principle is for, for larger n, for larger n, we can uh, assume more complex models. But obviously, for smaller n, um, we we need to like kind of make other sort of simplifying assumptions that uh, that tell us that that um that kind of allow us to 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 do to, to, to do inference so basically the idea would be that if you if you only if you observe a thousand sequences out of a possible five thousand hopefully there's enough signal like the like the model kind of generalizes well enough so that you can sort of predict the other five thousand from the other from the first thousand you have reasonably well so that's kind of the the principle behind things uh behind things here so you're never going to observe all of the x space or the the x variables and so um you know this is something you kind of need to need to think about like what how complex a model can you do and that's going to be very tied to um to how big your sample size is and we'll demonstrate that here with uh with, with our with our data so the first example is just a um you know a simple first order first order linear model okay which is just saying that uh, you know you have uh, x tilde uh, like like each uh, so each x is uh, is represented as as a you know one hot encoded encoded vector. Um, so each x is represented as a one hot encoded vector, and so there's going to be um, so sixteen. Uh, so so this model is going to have like sixteen features. Um, which means, uh, you know, as, as we saw, sixteen because it's that's going to be uh, uh, m minus one times uh, times p. Um, and uh, and so uh, you know certainly uh, and so then this can be thought of as like a main effects or a linear model. Um, well, I won't, I won't just say linear because the other models are also linear models as we'll talk about shortly, but we, we like all we're looking at is main effects. And so, um, and, and main effects. And so this would mean that um, 16 parameters to learn, 16 parameters to learn um, where each parameter encodes uh, whether uh, parent, we'll say parent K occurs in position J or, um, no, it doesn't encode that. What it encodes is, uh, encodes, uh,
encodes influence of uh, parent uh, k in position j. And influence, as we'll see when we start talking about modeling in the next lecture, will be uh, like, you know, how much does that uh, encode, uh, um, like how much does that, in like, like how much does that encode the like improvement or uh, or the degra degradation of the uh, of the functional performance? Um, but then you know you could also have what if you had uh, second order uh, second order interactions. So now you say well. Um, so, so so now so now what we have in in this case is that. Um, So you look at uh, two positions at a time. And so, you know, the inter like th there's potentially an interaction here that if, uh, you know, the first and second, uh, you know, if you look at the first and second positions together, maybe like the fact that, uh, you know, parent one and parent three and parent one occurs in position one and parent three occurs in position two together has a huge influence but if you separated them out, that influence is hard to see. And so that's why second order interactions become really important. So notice that uh, uh, the uh, number of uh, parameters in this model in this model are, um, you know, the order of, I'm using this notation, the order of it's like m minus one squared times p squared in this case. Um, it's actually not exactly that because there's various constraints, but it's kind of close to that in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 in terms of the order. And so then you're starting to see, you know, that this is gonna be equal to, you know, approximately 16 times 16 uh, features, which is, you know, still reasonably manageable here. We've got, uh, What's it going to be? It's uh, it's roughly you know, uh, what's sixteen times sixteen? I think it's two fifty six, but it may not be. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's correct. But yeah, you can uh, kind of check if that's uh, if that's right or not. And so this is still reasonable. So um, so given n equals nine eighty eight, so it's usually problematic when you start to fit models where the number of features starts to become larger than the number of samples. Uh, you, can, you can deal with that in ways, if, and, and I'll talk about that later as well, but uh, given n equals 988, uh, 256 parameters is still reasonable. Um, but then um, if you start to go to third order interactions, well, let's just say, uh, let's just be kind of specific that uh, If you start to go to order k interactions, um, the number of parameters um, goes goes to uh, goes to our order of, um, you know, m minus one to the k, p to the k. Um, and so then when you start to have, you know, like even for, for k equals three, this becomes huge. And, you know, it gets bigger and bigger until like, you know, obviously the full model is where you have k equals eight and that gives that get that's what gets you to kind of three to the eight eventually, um, and so um, becomes huge and and in fact larger than n. So in this case, um, in this case, um, it is reasonable to fit either first order or second order, second order, um, you know, linear models. 
Okay, and well, that's we're going to talk about the modeling phase in uh, in the uh, in the next lecture, um, but uh, that's kind of the you know it's a good sort of analysis to do before you start, and so similar ideas apply to continuous features. So if you have continuous features, um, essentially the idea is the same, except you don't have an M anymore for the number of categories. The order becomes, you know, like order of P. So um, uh, for P features, um, order K interactions um, has approximately order of uh, p to the k parameters because essentially you can imagine that you have a polynomial with all different kind of combinations of order k um, and so you have a, a huge number of parameters order of p to the k parameters so um, so um, so ideally you want n uh, much bigger than uh, order of p to the k to fit uh, to fit your model. Okay, so that's just kind of a general, uh, you know, a general uh, thought about how do we actually, uh, you know, choose, you know, how complex we want to model the feature space. And that's another really important question, another question we haven't really talked about in the uh, in the lectures, but, uh, and, and this is again, just a, a rule of thumb, but essentially you need enough data to make sure that uh, the model you fit is, 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 too com is, is not too complex. And as a, the other question you have to worry about, which we did touch on briefly is overfitting. So if you fit a very complex model, so the, the other sort of, yeah, other thing to think about is um, for more complex models, you might overfit. Um, um, this is something you don't really know a priori. Um, you can usually validate this, validate this when you run your model run your model or your models in particular. Um, and so this is something that we're gonna do. So, you know, you could fit a, you know, a first order, a second order, or however, however many order model, um, but you kind of want to make sure that you're not just sort of fitting a bunch of noise because, you know, in general for when, when, you, when you have, uh, you know, training data, the more complex a model you use, the better it's gonna fit that training data. But what you really want to determine is how well it performs on out of sample test data. And, uh, and so this is something we're going to talk about in the, in the next couple of lectures, which is a really kind of important, uh, important thing to think about. So, um, so up next, we're going to kind of focus on, uh, you know, uh, tasks five, six, and seven. Um, so we'll see how far we can get into, uh, into those tasks in the, in, uh, in lecture, uh, in the next lecture that, uh, that we cover. Um, but we've kind of, as you said, as, as I mentioned, nothing that we've done so far is related to what we've learned in the first 20 lectures. We're going to start to build that in in the next, uh, in the next lecture where we're going to kind of use what, what we know from those, uh, from those concepts to, to, to determine what, uh, what model or what approach we should, uh, what, what approach we should use. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that's, that's it for today.